James Leland Jackson, taken on January 14, 2004, at the Atlanta History Center for the Library of Congress's Veterans Project. Mr. Jackson, why don't you give us your date of birth? Date of birth, September 23rd, 1913. Where were you born? Atlanta, Georgia. And where do you currently reside? Live in Macon, Georgia, and Atlanta. Have you lived in Macon and Atlanta your whole Moved life? Moved to Macon in 1955. Went in business down there in 1955. What kind of business? Automobile business. Automobile retail. And I know you're currently married because your wife is sitting next to me. What is her name? Her name is Alice and her friends call her Boo. I call her Alice and when I refer to her with her friends I call her Boo. And do you have any children? I have two, son and a daughter. And what are their names? My son's name is James Leland Jackson Jr. And my daughter's name is Alice. Mr. Jackson, where do you go to high school? Tech High School. Is that located here in Atlanta? Oh yes. It was here a long time and it was uh, Tech High School and Boys High were, were put together and it, as Roosevelt High School. I think that's what it is now. That was 47. So you graduated in 47? High school. I graduated from high school, no. When, when did you graduate high school? 1931. What did you do after high school? I went to college, Georgia Tech. Were you in the ROTC program then? Naval ROTC. What was that like? Well, I, when you went to Tech, you had to take two years of military service, either in the Army or the Air Force or the Navy. The Navy seemed to be the most desirable. First thing, they furnished you uniforms. The Army did not. They had to buy the uniforms. That made a big difference to me at the time. And they paid you a little bit too, which is still a little bit. But it was a preferred service, and uh, we, uh, I was there in, a, in the program for four years. And when I graduated, I was commissioned as an ensign in the United States Navy, in the reserves. What year did you graduate? 1935. You said that the Navy was the more desirable of the branches of the military to be involved with. Did that mean that availability was? Availability was, uh, they couldn't accept everybody that applied. I was surprised that I was able to get in. Do you remember how they determined who got in? I don't know. Okay. I didn't investigate. I just applied and I was surprised when I was accepted. Did you have other friends who were commissioned? Oh, yes, 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 indeed. One of the, uh, he was commissioned two years, he graduated two years after I did at Georgia Tech, a fellow named Dave Long. He's an Atlanta boy, and he was out in the Pacific with me, and we're good friends, and he lives in Atlanta now. What is your first memory? First memory of the war. Now, do you want to start out before we got in, or? Sure. Yeah. I can start back at when I went on active duty. You want me to start there? Sure. All right. I was single at the time, and in the fall of 1940, George Griffin called me on the telephone. If you'd ever gone to Tech, you'd know George Griffin. He knew everybody. He was a dean of men and track coach, and uh, everybody loved George, and George knew everybody and did not forget a single name. He was a wonderful fellow, and they have a bronze cast of him now sitting on a bench at Georgia Tech campus. But George called me up and said, Leland, how would you like, now, the first thing he said was, do you have mobilization orders? And I said, yes, I'm going to, supposed to go to for old World War I force I could destroy at Panama. And uh, I said, that's not a good duty. And he said, I know. He said, how would you like to spend the entire war cruising up and down the east coast of Florida in a converted yacht? 
I said, George, you got to be kidding. I know you. He said, no. He said, uh, they do need some men down there at the Naval Reserve at Jacksonville. They've got a unit on active duty down there, and they need training. And he said, they need another officer down there. And so I thought of you. I thought you might like to do that. Well, I said, George, let me call you back in a few minutes, which I did. didn't take long because I was single. I didn't have to ask anybody's permission. And I said, you know, it sounds pretty good. I think I will. So I went down there, and uh, that's how I happened to get in this, on a call to active duty. And that was about the year before Pearl Harbor. And all we did was cruise around in a motor whale boat up and down the St. John's River because it didn't have any ships. The Navy was very short of ships, and that's the reason they were converting pleasure yachts to do uh, duty off the coast. Look for submarines or anything else when we got in the war. But they were converting these ships. But uh, that was about it in Jacksonville. And then in August of 1941, no, this was, oh, 1940. August 19, no, it was now August 1941. I was uh, called to Rockland, Maine to put a, help put a ship in commission that was being built up there. And that's a, I happened to get my first sea duty. And uh, stayed on that ship until, now Pearl Harbor, you asked me about that when I, where was I? I was lying up in the bunk on Sunday morning reading the newspaper with the radio on at Jacksonville, tied up to the dock. And that's when I heard it on the radio that the Japs had burned and had bombed Pearl Harbor. It's quite interesting, though, and when I went, when I was in the Naval ROTC back there from 1931 to 35, the officers there were sure we were going to get in a, a war with Japan. And they'd talk about their naval vessels and all that. And they, they, this, their attitude was that the Japanese Navy was inferior to ours. It didn't turn out that way. But they sure they could lick them, but they figured that we were going to have to go to war with them sooner or later. So when you were sitting in your bunk and heard about Pearl Harbor, was that the first thing that popped into your mind? Was the Well, a lot of things popped into my mind. I said, we're in it now. And uh, I figured it was going to take three or three or four years before the thing was over. But uh, of course, everybody got all excited, and we went out to patrol the entrance to the St. John's River. and. Everybody had, <laughs> we had what they call hot bunks, meaning that you'd sleep four hours and be on watch four hours, sleep four hours and be on watch four hours. They had too many men on board, so we'd have to use somebody else's bunk. But uh, the next thing that happened was they went to Charleston to put more he heavy armor on the ship. And while I was there, I got orders to Naval Mine Warfare School. This was. De this was in the same month, December, 1941, and went to Naval Mine Warfare School for three months in Yorktown, Virginia. What was that like? Uh, that was a training school for officers for mine warfare. There was four or five Georgia Tech boys up there. And uh, we, had a, we enjoyed it thoroughly. It was very simple. They had an MIT professor who was the smartest guy I ever saw teaching us electricity and magnetism, stuff like that. Of course, we, we, ate it, we, we knew everything he was talking about because most fellas was all this were new to him. But, you know, going to Georgia Tech, you studied all that stuff. But anyway, we, we had a good time up there. When I left, they sent me to Jacksonville to uh, take command of a YMS, that's a little a lot of mine sweeper, about 120 feet long, a wooden mine sweeper, and it was being built there. 
And so I took command of it. And uh, we finally wound up in the Caribbean escorting all small oil tankers from Colombia to the island of Aruba where they had refineries. And at that particular time, the German submarines were real active on the East Coast. You know, they, they would lay off of there and all these tankers would be running in the, in the, uh, in the uh, channel. And uh, they just spot them real easy and they sank a lot of tankers along there. How long was the mine warfare school? It lasted three months. Very intense. I mean, from morning to well, morning. it was in a way, but I don't look at it as that way. We they demonstrated on the yawl crew how to do it and all that sort of stuff. And it didn't seem to be too intense to us. We just had, I just remember having a good time. We go up to Williamsburg and every weekend, you know, and just enjoyed life. What was morale like among the other students there? Fine. That's what I recall. It was very fine. When you're young like that, you don't, it's just, everything's an adventure. Everybody was, was a conscious of that we were in war and that we were fighting, that we had a good cause. And the atmosphere of the country then was just all for service. We had to beat the Japs and the Germans. You said you were commanding a 20 foot long wooden mine sweeper. 120 foot. 100. Big difference. <laughs> yeah, big difference. What was that like? What was it like? Mm -hmm. Well, we never saw anything that was dangerous or anything else. We had, of course, we had all the mine sweeping gear on board, but we were supposed to do escort, meaning that we had depth charges, which you use against submarines, and sound gear to pick up the submarine. How many and people? I was about board? three or, well, I think it was about three or four officers and about, I'd say about, uh, I can't recall exactly, about 35 enlisted men. And you said you never came, never came across any German subs? Oh, no. Uh, but they were there. Matter of fact, I didn't stay down there too long. I was called in the fall of 19, this was 1942, to go to Miami to be minesweeping officer for the 7th Naval District, which was all the coast of Florida. And I would be stationed in Miami. And I was stationed there for one year. It's my responsibility to oversee all the, the exploratory mine sweeping in the particular harbors. All the big harbors had a couple of YMSs supposed to, you know, be checking to be sure the German submarines hadn't laid any mines. Was there any... Uh did it turn out that any mines had been laid in any of these harbors? No. The only mines that were laid were laid by us at Key West. And they were supposed to be protective mines, defensive mines. How do those operate? <laughs> you lay out a barrier of these and, and then notify everyone on your side where they are? Or? You better notify where they are, yeah. Now, I didn't do any mine laying, but I know how it was done. And uh, of course, it got to have a clear channel through these mines to get to the dock. Key West is on a, a bunch of reefs, you know, and the water is not very deep and it's very clear. And, uh, but they were, had a channel that was safe on either side of the channel where mines had been laid by the United States. And uh, we had, I won't get into it, you can get into a lot of discussion about particular type of mines, but these are moored mines that contact mines, as we call them. And uh, they were special type. They were chain, moored, and so on. Well, some other little things. But anyway, I knew how they operated. And uh, 
but a ship from South America with Wolframite O on it, which is 10 O in big demand, was coming into dock at Key West and got out of the channel and hit a mine. And was sunk right off the channel in the minefield. The water is not very deep there, so at low tide, you could see the, the deck house. And it was sitting upright. High tide, you could see the king post. But it was my job, they sent me down there to get the mines away from that ship so they could send them tugs in there to get the mine, get the iron ore out of the ships, because it was, they needed it. So I go down there and improvise a lot and finally blow up all the mines around the ship. Is that what, that was the way to remove a mine, is to simply blow it well, up? Well, it ain't simply to blow it up. We, first thing, these particular mines had a float on them. You gotta, if you hit this wire on the float, why it blow up the mine, or if you hit the mine, it would. So what you do is get a wire out there between two ships, and this is just a simple oversimplification. And when that wire hits that mooring wire, it blows the mine up. Now this is our mines. Japanese mines didn't have that. They were just a circular sphere with prongs on it. And uh, you had to hit one of those prongs and it had some, you would bend it and it would let some acid flow down inside and it would it would uh, cause a reaction and explode the mine. But uh, that's a typical mine. These were that plus some additional things. But the mine has put positive buoyancy. So if you cut the mooring cable, it'll float to the top and then you can dispose of it that way too while it's floating. That's the way you usually did. Was there much media attention to the sinking of his South American ship? No. So much going on, so many submarines out there, the second ships that were carrying supplies to England, it's up the east coast of Florida, they were bad. The German subs were all over the place up there. Do you remember your commanding officer when you were the uh, commander for the 7th Naval District? My commanding officer's name was Commander Steckham. He was a retired Annapolis man. How often did you interact with him? Well, his office was right in the same area. I was next to him, and we talk a lot, friendly, and about operation, that sort of stuff. He didn't know anything about mines. He didn't want to. Most people didn't. Most officers didn't want to know anything about them either. It's all kind of mysterious. They relied upon you for that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So where did you go next after uh, serving as commander for the 7th Naval District? Well, in December, November, December of 1942, 43, I was there during the year 43, I decided, and my conscience was getting the best of I me, mean, I wanted to get with it and get out in the Pacific where the action was. And I'd had enough of shore duty. So I called up a friend of mine in the Bureau of Personnel in Washington, and he, I told him that I wanted to get command of a fleet minesweeper in the Pacific. And he said, fine. He said, I'll fix you up. He knew me, knew my background, everything else. So I got orders to go to take command of the USS Revenge. Now I wanted him, I told him I wanted to get a new one that was being built at Portland, Oregon, under construction. I'd like to have that, you know, brand new and under construction, be there a while, know all about ship before I went to sea. But it didn't work out that way with me. He, this ship was at Pearl Harbor already, and I had already been in one invasion in the Marshall Islands. When I got there, the next day it was supposed to go out to invasion of Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands with the fleet. Well, they decided, I say they, it, it was decided maybe the best thing to do was to leave the commanding officer on board 
until that operation was over, which suited me just fine, because I didn't want to get on that commanding officer ship the next day, go on out, you know, in this operation with the fleet, never done that before, so that was fine. So that's what happened. We went, went right on out to Kwajalein and Marshall Islands, and uh, we took that. And right after we had taken it, I took command right there. So while they went out to the Marshall Islands, did you go with them, or did you stay back? I stayed on the ship. Oh yeah, it was interesting. And people knew that you were going to be assumed oh, yes. command of the ship. Yes. So what was your role on the ship during that? Nothing. Operation? Was that interesting? Observation. I wasn't officially. When you take command of a ship, it's a ceremony. You read your orders and that sort of stuff, and have all crew on the folks and that sort of stuff, and officially congratulate the new commanding officer and all that. So I was just a passenger on board, then I had not become commanding officer. I had no duties. Did any of the men know that you were going to be assuming that control? Did any of the men on the ship know that you were going to be commanding? Well, I'm sure they do. You know, nothing passes without important. Everybody knows everything. Well, how about when, when did you have the ceremony? Was that in the Marshall Islands or in the time? Marshall Islands? Sure did, right there in the middle of the lagoon in Kwajalein. Do you remember that day? Oh yes, absolutely. Why don't you describe that a little bit, the ceremony and taking command of the ship? <laughs> Not any big ceremony. No. All the men get on the forecastle. That's the forward part of the ship in formation, and and I read. I think I read my orders, and it's not too big a deal. I read my orders and so on and. He accepts it and congratulates me, and I always shake hands, and that's about it. You read your orders, and that's it. And then turn the ship back towards and the And I'm, I'm in command, and he leaves. That's it. Do you remember what your first, Proce huh? first orders were? What the orders were? Take command of the ship. How about after that? How about after that? After that, we uh, went up to an island and uh, picked up a couple of ships to escort back to Pearl Harbor. Now, these mine sweepers were pretty big. They were 220 feet long with about uh, 12 officers and 125 or 30 men. But we had all the equipment a destroyer had. We had sound gear, radar, three inch. 3 inch 25 guns, 20 millimeters, 40 millimeters, had sound gear, depth charges, and K guns. We had everything a destroyer had for anti submarine work, which we were supposed to do when we weren't sweeping mine. So I had to escort them. And what you do is when you escort ships, you get out ahead of them and you go back and forth from one side to the other with that sound gear sweeping out ahead to see if you can pick up anything. Really and it goes on constantly all the time while you, and you can hear it, sending out the pings. Was that technology accurate enough that you felt oh, safe yeah. doing it? Oh yeah, there's no problem with that, no. Uh, but we had that thing going all the time. A man was operating it 24 hours a day when you were at sea. Did you encounter any problems going back to Pearl Harbor? No, 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 we just got back. And uh, I think fortunately they had a problem with one engine. We had four diesel electric engines, very powerful. You have to have lots of power because you're pulling that sweep gear when you're sweeping mine. And we could do, we could tow vessels a lot larger than we were too, and we did. We had to tow one vessel all the way from from Quiet from uh, from uh, the South Pacific to Pearl Harbor. We had to tow it all the way back, and we could do that. But what I was saying was, when we arrived at Pearl Harbor. We got orders to go to San Francisco 
to repair this main engine, which is a very joyful news. So we stayed there 30 days and then headed back. What did you do during the 30 days? Well, I don't know what, everybody did a lot of different things. I don't think we need to discuss all that here. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, at the expiration of the 30 days, what did you do? We went back to, we went back to Pearl Harbor, asked God to ship back to Pearl Harbor. And after that, I think that was in about in July of 1944. Uh, after that, we did escort duty between Pearl Harbor and some of the islands. I always had to supply them, a lot going on back and forth. And uh, that kind of duty was, it was pretty dull. That's a problem on that type of work a lot of time. It's pretty boring. It's the same thing all every day. You know, nothing. You, well, you, you do a lot of training on board. And you, practice target shooting all that sort of stuff but it's kind of boring it's, it's an unusual thing but I want to say unusual but it's an interesting thing that the men on board were looking for any kind of excitement sweeping mines shooting at airplanes anything they never got they, they weren't afraid of anything all they wanted it was something to do and get a shot at something did that ever come huh did that ever come oh yes Particularly, particularly in Okinawa. Oh yeah, plenty. Hell oh, yes. Well, when did the monotony of the, of it stop? When it stopped, were well, two times, I suppose. Once when they had shore duty, or could get off the ship, or when we were sweeping, or maybe going through training exercise. We'd you know go out with three or four ships at a time and do maneuvers with them. We'd fire targets, pull by a plane, that sort of stuff. And go out and practice sweeping. So after you left uh, Pearl Harbor, where did you go after that? After I left Pearl, <coughs> well, when we left Pearl Harbor for good, we went to Ulithi, which is a staging area for the invasion of the Philippines. And that's when we uh, went to the Battle of the Lady Gulf. You probably heard of Battle of Lady Gulf. And there were mines in the entrance to that harbor, up to the Gulf, there was mines. And we had to sweep them, and we did. In bad, in a bad weather tail end of a typhoon. That's what we had to watch out for. Typhoons occurred real often, didn't last long. You'd try to run away from them, what you did most of the time. How does that affect your work when you're dealing with horrible weather like that? Well, you say affect my work, the mine sweeping. It, well, you couldn't do it when it was in, if you were right in the middle of a typhoon, but you know, you can be on the edge or it can be have passed by, but the weather's still rough and the waves are still high. But you can you need, prefer calm weather. But you can do it when the water's a little rough. It just makes it more difficult. But we had to do it the next day to keep the invasion on schedule, and the water was pretty rough. And we went in there and swept some mines, and it was kind of exciting for the boys because the way we dispose of them was with a 30 caliber rifle. And they'd stand up on the flying bridge of those rifles, and man, they just had a big time. They'd hit one here, this big explosion, you know, and shrapnel falling down on the deck and everything else. But uh, there's a lot more details to it, you know. You, it's, you have to watch out what you're doing as commanding officer to be sure your ship doesn't hit a mine that's cut with a ship in front of you. So you know, it's about, you usually have formation about six ships, four to six ships. And uh, they're in echelon formation where the first ship 
goes in without any protection. The rest of them, are, they go in and swept air, and the sweep, and the sweep gives streams out about 45 degrees, usually to starboard, sometimes to port, but usually to starboard, and to the right. And uh, so the second, third, and fourth ship, they always, the ship's in swept waters, but the sweep gives out and water's been unswept. But what you got to do is watch out for the ship ahead, or when he cuts those mines, you don't want to run into them, because they're floating. Did that ever happen? When you were a, a Oh, well, that I had had a couple of exciting events happen when they cut two of them, and I had a, one of them on my port bow, one on the starboard bow, and I had to get out of the way of both of them. How did you do that? Just maneuver the ship properly, and I watched it go down the sides, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Just be careful maneuvering the ship. So after the uh, Battle of Lady Guff, the Battle of Lady Guff, where'd you go next? What did I do? Yeah, well, we swept the mines to the Gulf, and then we went in that anchor. And uh, we didn't do anything during the Battle of Lady Guff except hear what was going on. I didn't know all of it until later, but I knew there's something big going on, and they had Japanese ships coming up through Surigao Straits from the south, and another task force of Japanese ships coming through San Bernardino Straits from the north. And we had six old battleships in there looking after us. And I figured they might get in there and start bombarding everything in there, all everybody in the anchorage. And so I was <laughs> on the bridge looking at the chart to find a place I could go hide, a little stream. <laughs> so, but that's, that's uh, I didn't naturally take any part in the battle. But that was, we knew what was going on. We could see the flashes and hear the voice radios cackling and all that sort of stuff. Was that normal during battles for you to serve the purpose of sweeping mines and then to anchor and wait? Well, we have done our job, and sometimes they'll send us away immediately to escort a ship that's been hit or something, mm -hmm. and uh, or even to tow some ship. In this, in this particular case, there was a destroyer that was hit pretty badly, and I'll never forget this one. He came up alongside and tied was for service. It couldn't cook, had no fresh water, no nothing, because our ship had been damaged so heavily. And he tied up alongside of us, and uh, it was a, a, a bad experience because I could see the bodies of the sailors. You know, one of them was cut in half, you know, and he was straightening them out so he could bury them at sea and all that sort of stuff. It was, it was pretty bad. But uh, that we did not have any further engagement. We don't do anything except sweep mines were you ever in and escort duty. Were you ever in a situation where you feared falling under fire? Yes, but it was Okinawa, and that was a devil ball game. Okay. They really put us to work up there. Was that the next destination after this? Yeah. Okay. We went. We had a bad shaft. There was. It was out of line, and we had to go back to Pearl Harbor and get it straightened out. And then we <clears throat> went back and to the rendezvous area where we would uh, go with the task force to Okinawa. So we go up there with the fleet, and we sweep the areas where the invasion is going to go, they fire, they're firing right over us. You can see them, the battleships and the cruisers and destroyers are firing over you, their batteries, and while you're sweeping. And uh, at that particular sweep, one of the ships had a mine, one right ahead of me, sank in about five minutes, lost three men. But the the problem at 
Okinawa, I say problem. It uh, was a responsibility that was pretty hard. We had to do picket duty. Now, picket duty was done by destroyers and fleet minesweepers. And that meant that maybe 20 or 25 miles from the anchorage area where the planes, where the Japanese planes would come down from the north, we'd be out there with our aircraft radar and pick up those planes and let the fleet know they were coming in. Well, they'd come in and they'd go after us sometime too, out on picket duty. I mean, we had a hard time, those destroyers did too. And they were kamikazes, you know what they are. Right, yes. And so we were doing that, that was pretty bad. And uh, one, one uh, minesweeper was hit, and uh, we shot down, I think, one plane was coming at us, but there was also a Navy Corsair after it too, so we don't know who knocked it down, but we, we had plenty of action. You, were, you previously mentioned that your ship actually had a lot of the weaponry that had what? battleships. It had a lot of the weapons that battleships had. Not the battleship, destroyers. Of course, the battleships had everything. Okay. Yeah. Destroyers had l larger guns. They had 3-inch 50s. Uh, they had 5-inch 50s, and we had 3-inch 50s. And these were what you were using to shoot at the aircraft? We used them, yeah. That, 40 millimeters, 20 millimeters. Alright, why don't you tell me more about your service in Okinawa? Well, Okinawa, as I was saying, is it was where the hardest duty we had because we were on picket duty 24 hours a day. Day after day after day, and each Japanese plane come down from the north at, on a moonlight night or in the morning or at dusk, that sort of stuff. They were all kamikazes, going to dive right into you. No bombs, just dive into you. And, uh, some unusual things happened, but we never did get hit. Uh, one little incident that was kind of interesting to me, this particular time they had to, we were supposed to, to uh, guard the anchorage area at night because there's a lot of Japanese on those islands, some islands around Okinawa there, and they t had the word that <clears throat> they were going to send suicide boats in. Some of them would come in there and climb up to anchor chains and that sort of stuff and blow, try to blow up the ship. So we were out there at night keeping an eye out because everything was completely dark. And uh, I was in my bunk and they called me up to the bridge and said, Captain, we have it picked up at a bogey, we think a bogey is an unidentified aircraft or vessel <clears throat> on the radar, and uh, there's not there's supposed to be any boats out there. I said, it sure is not. So I looked at the radar and saw it was moving, and it kind of got a bearing on it, and I said, I, I'll use the signal gun and give them a code. You know, it's a red light. You know what a signal gun is? It's just a, a, a barrel round barrel light thing about three inches of diameter, about that long. And uh, you point it at the boat. It can be seen on the side. You point it at the boat, you pull the trigger, and you can send a Morse code with it. Well, I sent the signal, got no answer at all. But it was coming in. So I called General Quarters, which means everybody goes to their battle station. And uh, they get that about three minutes. They get all excited. When that thing goes off, these boys really, they put their life jackets on, their helmets, and they're gone to that battle station. Won't know what's going on. Excitement. Well, I couldn't get any response, so I said, well, and he was still moving, coming toward me a little bit, it looked like, moving generally. So I told the fella at the search light, I said, the hell with to put that light on that and let's see who this, what this thing is. So we did, and we could see there's a boat out there with about three men on it, and they were monkeying around on the boat, and it was going fast, and 
It looked like it had a depth charge or something on it. I couldn't tell. And But it started heading toward us at high speed. And I said to myself, that's a Jap showing up. Got to be. Let them have it. So, man, they opened up, and that thing was gone in about three seconds. <laughs> and there was two of them were swimming around in the water, and the boat was ablaze and blown up. And, and uh, I called the task force commander, and I said, what, are, what do I do with these guys in the water? I said, do I take them prison, try to take them prison or anything? He said, no, shoot them. That was it. But I just couldn't see shooting men in the water, helpless in the water, for some reason. So I told two or three of the fellows on the bridge that it had, they had rifles and some machine guns. I said, shoot them. And I walked on the other side of the bridge. I couldn't look at it. But it had to do it. Of course, the attitude was, you know, these guys swim around the water. They'd come over to some ship and climb up the chain or something like that. They were suicide people. So that was kind of exciting evening, though. But, uh, Okinawa was pretty busy. And it came to my diary when I read it. I was getting awful tired day after day after day. And we'd go to anchor for a couple of days for maintenance in, a, in a, an area there called Karamaretto, which is a bunch of islands with a lot of water in the middle where it was protected. The planes couldn't get in there very well. Japanese planes couldn't get in there too well. They were going to dive on us. So we went there and stayed about two or three days. But they'd still come in at moonlight nights and in the morning and at night. And you'd have to make smoke. <laughs> and there wasn't much rest there. And then we'd go back on the same thing. Finally, we got down to Guam, they sent us to Guam for some maintenance and recreation. And uh, then we went back to Okinawa. Now this was about July 45, the war in Europe was over. And uh, that's when we heard about the atomic bomb. We were anchored in Nagagusaki One, which is called Buckner Bay now. <laughs> and we <clears throat> we heard about the bomb being dropped, and I wrote a few remarks in my diary what I figured. I figured that the Japs are going to have to surrender. This is a devastating weapon. I said, they just can't go on with this, this type of thing. And then I said, I had a little foreboding about what this meant about war, too, for the future, a weapon like this. But anyway, about a week later, of course, the Japanese said they wanted to a treaty to surrender. Well, you never saw such excitement all your life in that bay. Oh, everybody just went crazy, shot the air, anti-aircraft guns, and uh, all up in the air, you know, and just looked like the 4th of July. And the shrapnel was falling around on the ships, everything else. Everything, every gun in the whole bay, I think, was being fired. And of course, the Admiral there, he just raised sand about it and it finally stopped him. And, uh, but we knew that the war was over then. And about that time was when I got orders to take ships up to Tokyo, meet the third fleet, sweep the channel into Tokyo Bay. Well, what was that like? So they started. sent me orders and told me what ships I should take. I had, I think I had uh, four AMs, which is not type of fleet mine sweep, and a bunch of YMS, the smaller wooden ships. Now they are real good, the wooden ships, because of magnetic mines. And I have mentioned that it's something the Germans developed and uh, used it on the British 
an entrance to the Thames River, the Thames Estuary, and uh, it was a, ma a magnetic mine. It was dropped by a plane, hit the bottom, and it would set off an explosive by magnetism of the ship as it passed over it or nearby it. All metal ships have magnetic field around them, and when that ship would pass over it, it would blow it up. They, uh, the British didn't know what the hell was going on for a good while, but they find a guy drop one on the beach and they figured out what it was. But we uh, <clears throat> we had developed it too, and. As I recall, I, we didn't expect any magnetic mine, but you had to be sure. Well, the YMSs were supposed to sweep the magnetic mines. They are wooden ships. Now we had to, we had that problem too. You know, we had a magnetic field and a metal ship. What they did at Pearl Harbor, though, was what they called the gaucher, which means they neutralize your magnetic field. You sit there and they put a field around you for about a half a day and you don't have any magnetic field. So, But the wooden ships don't have any anyway because they don't have a magnetic field. wooden ship doesn't. So they were sweeping the magnetic mine, for a magnetic mine. And they followed us. Of course, they didn't find any. And uh, But that's, they gave me a, <clears throat> when we got there, they, uh, they put a Japanese naval officer on board, a lieutenant who had gone to Yale, speak perfect English, and he brought charts of the 20-mile channel in the Tokyo Bay. And they had to have a channel which was not mined to get their own ships in. But we were going to use that channel, and then we had the charts. But they wanted to be absolutely sure there no mines in the channel. So I was ordered to take these ships in there to the channel and go into Tokyo Bay, which we did. We swept the whole way, 20 miles, no mines. We got in the bay. The most exciting thing I saw first was a sign hanging from a warehouse building and it said, welcome U.S. Navy, come and get us, prisoners. And uh, so then we went on in and swept Anchorage Airs and anchored. But we had a good, op I had a good opportunity to go, saw a Japanese battleship and destroyer that had been damaged heavily and went aboard, it was there. And then we got on a train, went to Tokyo. Just another officer that I mentioned, Dave Long. He was one of the commanding officers of one of the ships and uh, went to Tokyo and uh, everything up there was dirty and smelly and damaged, no merchandise, no nothing. Of course, the Empress yard grounds were perfect shape and uh, and the people up there were, the train, when we were, we were on the train, they full of Japanese. But they were very different, you know, and they would have been instructed, don't bow to a Japanese when they bow to you. And uh, so we didn't. One little incident was kind of interesting. As Dave and I were walking back to the train station in Tokyo, we went through an area which somebody said had been an area where they made movies has nothing to do with the story, but anyway, walking along, and there was a nice little cottage here, and the man was standing right out there in the, in the, dry, in the path there, and he made some motion to go into his house. And Dave and I understood what he was trying to say, and I asked Dave, I said, you think we ought to go in? He said, well, I don't see any reason why. I said, I don't either. Let's go in. So we took off our shoes, went in, sat down on the floor and drank, and sipped green tea. <laughs> they sip it out of a saucer. And they gave us a lot of little gifts, just as nice as they could be to us, which I still have some of them. And, uh, but that's just a little incident there. But the Japanese, they didn't give any problem at all. No, no. 
But after that, uh, we had to do a lot of, we swept more mines after the war than we did before, during the war. The mines, there were lots of mines laid all around the east coast of Honshu, that's the main island, and uh, out in the East China Sea, and I had to do a lot of that. And uh, that was the last operation I was out there. We were sweeping, had 20 ships sweeping big areas. Of mines had been laid, I think, for for submarine protection by the Japanese to protect against U.S. submarines coming up into that area. And uh, so we could, we knew all the mines was way down in the water. That is, the depth of the mines were no problem. If they lay them under 12 feet, uh, you're in trouble, see, because we drew 11 feet. If you, they let at 12 or 11 feet, while well, we'd hit one of them. Well, usually they laid them at least 10 or 12 feet because uh, if it didn't, if the water got rough, it might pull them loose. But anyway, we knew they were way down there, so we knew, and we swept a world of mines out. And that's when I got relieved of command, which was the happiest day of my life. When did that news come to you? Hmm? Do you remember when that news came to you? It was in September of 1945. But the point was that I, he was on the way. And I think the first one was August, and but he got delayed for some reason. So I was elated and then despondent. And then finally he said somebody else was on the way. And he came and relieved me of command right out there in the East China Sea, and boy was I happy. Did you stay in Japan or immediately return back to the States? Came straight home to the States. No, I won't get on. No, sir. It was quite an interesting trip back. What happened? Well, no, nothing really happened except it was a big uh, transport ship, had a whole bunch of sailors going back. And Dave and I were the only two commanders on the ship, in rank of commanders. I don't think he had been promoted then, he was still lieutenant commander, but I was in charge of all the people on board ship. And the captain was a nice guy, but he, he said, you I don't know the term he used, but anyway, I was responsible for all of the passengers, the, the, the seamen coming back, or the men coming back. And so I said, Dave, I'm going to make you my executive officer. You be sure and look after this job. <laughs> but anyway, we'd look down there and hell, they were gambling. Not supposed to gamble on the ship. You know, look down there playing cards and gambling, rolling dice. I said, I didn't see that, did you? He said, no. <laughs> but they ran into, we ran into a mine and the captain was all excited because it wasn't danger hitting it. He saw it. He said, what do we do? We can't, we see this mine floating out here and it's danger. I said, we get rid of it. So I told him to get me a 30 caliber rifle, two or three of them, get these boys and do some target. So they blew it up. <laughs> but got back and they were, got on a train, wonderful trip back to Chicago. So I went to Portland, Oregon. Great Northern Railroad. I think that's the name of it full of naval officers and army officers. Everything was, everybody was happy and everybody had a bottle and everybody was playing card and we were trying to sing. It was, it was a fun trip back. There's one other little thing <clears throat> that I wanted to mention, which has nothing to do directly with the time of duty, is what happened here yeah, back in 19, what was it, 1992? What happened? Uh, there's a group in Atlanta, I mean a group in Washington, D.C., that is called <clears throat> the uh, Historical Remembrance Award 
that gives a historical remembrance award at a luncheon of the Service Naval Association. This, uh, what they do is honor heroes of World War II. Surface, not aircraft, nor submarines. Surface vessel, a hero, an individual who did something unusual. And uh, they, somebody mentioned to him that they ought to think about my mine sweepers. So they did, and they, they selected me to represent the mine sweepers. So I went to Washington, and there they gave me that award. And uh, I just read this. I read it to you. Please accept my congratulations on your selection to receive the Historical Remembrance Award at the luncheon of the Surface Naval Association on January 14, 1993, 98, 98. Both your selection and participation in the award ceremony made the Naval Mine Warfare Association proud. Actually, the report I get is that you wowed them. Recognition of some of the feats performed by Minecraft personnel during World War II and Korea have long been ignored. Perhaps at this late date, some of these stories will come to light. Your acceptance speech might just have opened a door or two in this direction. I know that I speak for the entire Naval Mine Warfare Association when I say well done. Now, the thing about the mine sweeping it's the most unglamorous part of the nation. Nobody knows anything about it, and they don't want to know anything about it. I get the impression when we, a destroyer or two would take us to an area to be swept, and they just practically disappear over the rise. They didn't want any part of it. It's a mysterious business, and it's very unglamorous. And uh, I'm going to read you something here that that uh, Admiral Nimitz said, Fleet Admiral Nimitz summed it all up when he wrote, whether the task was laying mines or sweeping them up, mine warfare was a far from glamorous business. <clears throat> Minecraft worked in bad weather and dangerous waters under enemy attack with little publicity and few rewards for daring deeds and, and well done. No matter what the job was given to the Minecraft, they did it. On this lot, author of Most Dangerous Sea added, there's no place for heroes in mine warfare. Men did their duty, men did their dad danger, men died. But who they were, no one will ever know. Nice words from Fleet Admiral Nimitz, but on a lot comes closer to the truth. The two top nominees were Commander J. Leland Jackson, USNR retired, commanding officer of the USS Revenge, and radio when Carl W. Allen, U.S. Navy, retired, who also served aboard the Revenge. Well, that was the award in 1993. Eight. Oh, 98, yes, 98. You also received a uh, Navy Bronze Star? Yeah. When did you receive that? After, the, after I got back to Atlanta. And uh, this is in the Constitution, as I showed you this mm -hmm. picture of me. And we'll photograph those, as well, or I'm sorry, yeah. photocopy those. Play pod? We're going to photocopy those for yeah. the listener. Well, what it says here, Commander Jackson awarded star for Tokyo feat. Bronze star has been awarded Commander Jackson of 1630 Johnson Road Northeast for outstanding courage, leadership, and ability as commanding officer of the, a Navy minesweeper and later as task group commander of the 5th Fleet's mine force during this minesweeping operation in Tokyo Bay before the first entrance by U.S. forces. Now, you had mentioned that your friend Dave Long had also returned at the same time you did? Yes, he did. Had he uh, 
started his service at the same time too? Yes. So that two of you went to the same ROTC program? Yes. And you served, and you keep in touch with him now? I was his best man in his wedding, he was my best man. That's fantastic. He lives here right now, he's not in good health. Well, how did the Georgia Tech boys do when they were in the service? Well, very well. Uh, I was even surprised. I ran into two of them, my friends, that were commanding officers of submarines. But they did very well, and none of them had minesweepers in the Pacific, just like mine, fleet minesweepers. And, they, <clears throat> and I ran into them after the, we had defeated the Germans. They sent all the ships to the Pacific, all the minesweepers, and we ran into a few of them at Guam. They were coming back. They were all, they didn't know what the hell was going on. They were really excited about getting over here in the Pacific. But I ran into a number of Georgia Tech boys. But they were very active in everything. I did well. I was asked by one of the chief of staff before we went to Tokyo Bay, he was asking me about preparation so on had some other officers around and he says he turned to me and finally said Commander Jackson can you assure me there won't be any mines in that channel when you when the capital ships come in I said yes sir I can that's all he ever said that's all I ever said that's all he wanted to hear <laughs> but he came over later and he said what class of Annapolis were you I said Captain, I said, I didn't go to Annapolis, I'm Georgia Tech. He said, why don't you all bunch them around here? I said, you right about that, and they're good officers. I said, that's right. But they were after officers then. When I got out of school in 1935, nobody could get a job of any kind, hardly. And we all wanted to go on active duty. There was a job, but they didn't have any openings. It, it took three people. One in the Marine Corps and two in the Navy. But they were after them after the war was over. What were, how were you received by Atlanta when you returned? How, how was I received? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's a question I can answer because everybody was congratulating me and everybody, you know, anytime they'd see an officer, they come up and congratulate you and welcome you home and all that. World War II is completely different from anything that's happened since. Everybody and during World War II was gung-ho about the war. The high patriotism, everybody. Everybody wanted to help. Everybody was a hero when he came back. Completely different. As a matter of fact, I wore my uniform for about three months because I didn't have any other clothes particularly. I don't think I could get in them. I gained a little weight. And I was on pay for three months, so I was on actually what you call terminal leave three months. I was paid. Do you have any uh, general thoughts or opinions about that war or anything since then? <laughs> Words of wisdom, they call it. <laughs> well, I'd say this, maybe. It's interesting that uh, very few people uh, in the general public did not, and uh, veterans particularly, didn't care about talking about the war right after the war. They didn't, they weren't, it wasn't that they were intimidated or felt like nobody wanted to hear it. They weren't interested. All I was interested in doing was getting myself married and have a, get a job in the future. Here I was 30 years old, I didn't even know what I was going to do. You're not interested in talking about what's in the past, you've got a future ahead of you. And that's, all the veterans felt the same way. You could go to school on the Navy, you could get a job where the Navy would pay part of the salary, which I did. and. Uh, but we weren't interested in talking about the war. It was past. See, 
you got a future now you got to worry about. The past is it's there, but, but we were interested in the present and the future. And uh, one other thing, I was forgot what it was I was going to say. Um, we uh, we were pretty. Oh, the mine sweeping part of the Navy. Nobody paid much attention to that. That was the most unglamorous job you could have. It really was. No, it's like Nimitz said. Nobody wanted to talk about it much. You kind of, you felt like it. The other Navy boys and destroyers and cruisers, all that they kind of pushed you over one side. You know, well, you got to get out there and get with the mine so we can go in and do some work. So it was un it was unglamorous, but we didn't feel that way about it. I, I not a, no, <laughs> not one of those officers would want to be on the ship when we were sweeping mines. I can tell you that because it's too mysterious. Was there anything I haven't asked you about that you wanted to talk about? Well, not really. I don't think <clears throat> when I was making that acceptance speech at the at the, the uh, Naval Remembrance of War one that I was talking about. Boy, I, I had it written out because I had a letter from Admiral informing me that I wanted to, they wanted me to receive the award and my acceptance speech should be held to three minutes if possible. And I got up and I started out. I said, I'm going to tell you one thing. I've never asked a veteran yet any questions that he could answer in three minutes. I said, it usually sets him off for 30 minutes. But I said, that's the reason I wrote it out, because that's all I'm going to say. And I did say a little more. Well, Mr. Jackson, I thank you for your time today. Well, I've enjoyed it. Most I've talked about the wars in a long time. Well, I'm, I'll tell you one more thing that I forgot to mention, which means a lot to me. It has nothing to do with sweeping mines exactly, but we had to, on the way back to Pearl Harbor, we were proceeding independently, and we were on this one shaft because we had to go back there to get it repaired. But Christmas Day was, we were out in the middle of the Pacific, halfway between Guadalcanal and Pearl Harbor. Had a baker on board, Finest guy you ever saw. He's a fine Christian boy. And he could really make the apple pies. I'll tell you, we had good food on board. No question about that. We had steaks about every other night and all that stuff. Ham, turkeys. But I, he came to me and his name was Castle. He said, Cammy said, I think we ought to have a service on Christmas Day. And I said, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I said, what do you suggest? He said, well, I'll tell you what we can do. And so he kind of took charge, you know, and we finally wound up on Christmas Day with everybody, including the officers and the, and the uh, men's, uh, men's uh, eating place. Can't, you know, if you get my age, you forget names and places. But um, we had... Uh, all kind of good food. I had bought an accordion at Pearl Harbor, a used one, and I had learned to play it because I took piano when I was real young. So I could play all the Christmas hymns. So we started singing, and you never heard such singing in all your life. As we sang all the Christmas hymns, and the officer read the scripture from a Bible, castles gave a nice prayer, and we just had a wonderful time, and all the boys enjoyed it so much. The other thing I was just statement I was gonna make short in finality. That nothing in my life has ever matured me more than the Navy. When they tell you to do something, you don't say, I'll try, I think I can, I'll do my best. You say, Yes, sir, I will. I mean that's the way it is and 
we went to a reunion one time. If I fifty the reunion, my wife and I did, and and uh, she saw him come up and speak to me, and also with such respect and all that, she was really surprised, you know. And, and uh, one fellow, one little old boy, came up and said, "Can you remember me?" He said, "I'm only man that fell on board and yourself." I said, "Yeah, I remember you. I remember when it happened." He says, "I was out there in the Pacific." And all alone, and said, the happiest moment of my life was to see that ship turn around and pick me up. <laughs> I said, I bet it was. But she says something about, it's not, the ship's not very democratic, is it? I said, hell no. I said, the commanding officer is responsible for everything that happens on the ship, period. Whether he knew about it or saw it or anything else, he's responsible. And I said, He's a dictator, and I said, he has to be. If you're responsible for anything that goes on on the ship, you're going to have to be a dictator. Okay. <laughs>